Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for your warm welcome to Georgia Tech. I have looked forward very much to coming here because in my youth I wanted to be an electrical engineer and uh, I gather that this university has great distinction in its production of electrical engineers but whether fortunately or unfortunately I was persuaded to do mathematics and ended up at Cambridge in England but thank you nonetheless for your very warm welcome and I've been invited to address the topic a convergent dichotomy, an Oxford mathematician on the axioms and implications of science. I'm not sure what a convergent dichotomy is, but we shall see what we make of it as we proceed. Axioms I do understand, because I spent a large part of my professional life studying the implications of a set of four axioms which lie at the basis of the axiomatic system called group theory. From my childhood, I was fascinated by logical analysis. And we were taught Euclidean geometry. And it was fascinating for me to see how wonderful theorems like that of Pythagoras could be deduced by a bit of logical wizardry from a very few postulates or axioms. And one of the questions people asked was, did you need all those axioms to construct the system? And I soon discovered that for centuries, people had tried to deduce that Euclid's parallel axiom, his fifth postulate, they tried to deduce it from the others, and they couldn't do it. And in the 19th century, Bolyai and Lobachevsky showed that you could construct non-Euclidean geometries, hyperbolic and elliptic geometries that didn't satisfy the parallel axiom. Now, Euclid's geometry was very useful for calculating fields and buildings. But what about these new geometries? Were they any use? And it turned out that they were exactly what was needed to study space-time and were crucial to Einstein's amazing work on relativity. It was heady stuff for a schoolboy. And as a result, I fell in love with axiomatic systems. And as I say, spent my life trying to work out some of the implications of the four axioms that lie at the base of the abstract concept of a group that finds its application in study of symmetry, in crystallography, particle physics, relativity theory, and so on. And my subject has the distinction, whether you'd regard it as a distinction, we'll see, of having the longest theorems and proofs in history. I can well remember when Fight and Thompson, two American mathematicians, distinguished themselves by proving a single theorem that required a 250-page edition of a mathematical journal to prove it. But that was nothing compared with the 10,000 pages of argument required in my field to give the famous classification of finite simple groups. I'm not going to bother you with any of that tonight. You'd be glad to hear. But, you know, axioms, what are they? They're fundamental postulates on which everything else is built. And so it was very natural for me to ask, what about mathematics itself? Does it have fundamental postulates? And what about science, which is larger than mathematics? Are there basic assumptions that are believed by all scientists? Or is it somehow axiom-free? And as I begin to research into this, I found all kinds of fascinating things. I noticed that all scientists believed one absolute axiom. They believed that science could be done. Now, that may not strike you as important, but it is extremely important. The fact that we can do science and that belief that it can be done lies at the heart of every true scientist. If you didn't believe that, you wouldn't do science. Now, 
I met some people who believed that science was ever more closely approximating to a truth that was out there. And that's the position I myself would take. We call it critical realism. I also found some people who believed there was no such thing as truth. And yet they expected me to believe that what they said was true, which didn't seem to me to be particularly impressive. It was a self-contradictory axiom. I noted incidentally that not many of them were scientists. At least if they were, they left their postmodernism outside the laboratory. So I then discovered that some people were so enamored with science that they believed that it was the only way to truth and that therefore science was coextensive with rationality. Now, if that were the case, of course, half the faculties in most universities in the world, perhaps apart from this one, would have to close. I don't know whether you do any humanities here or not, but most <laughs> universities do, and Harvard, for instance, would have to close half its faculties, and so would Oxford, if science was the only way to truth. Now, another thing I discovered that many people took as a fundamental postulate is that science, on the one hand, and faith in God, on the other, are at war. There was a deep-seated belief, and there still is, that scientific progress will eventually rid the world of a need for something beyond science to explain the toughest questions about the universe, as your invitation card says. So there appears to be a tension between science on the one hand and faith in God on the other. I would like to suggest that that is a false and dangerously false assumption. And it should be obvious that it's false. Take the Nobel Prize for Physics. Last year it was won by Peter Higgs, a Scotsman, much to the delight of the Scots. And he is an atheist. A few years ago, an American won it. His name is William Phillips, a low temperature physicist. He won the same prize as Higgs, but he is a theist, he's a Christian. Now, it ought to be completely obvious that what divides these two men is not their science. They have both won the top prize in physics in the world. What divides them is their world view. Peter Higgs, an atheist, William Phillips, a Christian. And I want to suggest to you that we'll never understand the contemporary debate unless we see that we are faced in this academy, as in every others, with two diametrically opposed worldviews. Worldviews, of course, are our set of answers to the big questions of life. And one of the questions that's been asked since the time of the ancient Greeks is, what is the nature of ultimate reality. What is the really real? And Democritus and Luke Hippus, who were the brilliant fathers of the atomic theory, they had the idea that you could keep dividing matter up and up and up until you reached an atom, atomos, something that could not be cut. Now, of course, we know that they were wrong, but it was a brilliant idea. And they then approached ultimate reality in this way. They said, well, there are two fundamental things constituting reality. There are the atoms and there is empty space. And therefore, their view of explanation depended on this fundamental postulate. Everything had to be explained bottom up in terms of atoms and the void. So they came up with theories like the atoms fell through empty space and they agglomerated and they formed galaxies and stars. You know the story. That is the philosophy we often call materialism. Now, at the same time, there were people like Socrates and Plato and Aristotle who believed, yes, the physical world is real, but the really real is something beyond the physical world. There, are, there is transcendence. There are the gods, or there is God. And so, barreling up towards us in the 21st century, there are those diametrically opposed worldviews and various shades, of course, in between. But one tends to find that the so-called tension between science and belief in God is 
a misrepresentation of the tension between those two worldviews. And the interesting thing, to my mind, is this. There are scientists on both sides. There are engineers on both sides. There are very high-powered thinking people on both sides of that divide. So that is the first point. I suggest that it's a worldview tension, and it's not a tension between science and belief in God. So the real question we need to ask is this. If we believe in God as the creator and sustainer of the universe, does that in itself create tension with a scientific approach to reality? Or do those two approaches in some sense converge even though they are very different? The key question then for me is this. Granted that there are those two worldviews and others in between, in which direction does science point? Where does it sit? Does it, like Richard Dawkins would suggest, point towards atheism? Or does it, as I would suggest, point towards theism? So we can only decide things like this by looking for evidence. Now, I emphasize the word evidence. I'm not talking about mathematical proof. Because mathematical proof, in the narrow sense, you only find in pure mathematics. You don't find it in physics, you don't find it in chemistry, you don't find it in engineering. In all of those other fields, more strictly, we should refer to evidence. Now, it can be immensely powerful evidence. For example, I flew yesterday in a plane from London to Atlanta. I believe there was enough evidence to trust this particular Boeing to take me here. That is, I trust the engineers, and I'm staking my life on their competence. So just because there's no mathematical proof doesn't mean we can't have enough evidence on which to stake our lives. And of course, in other things, even more important than engineering, um, I cannot prove to you mathematically that my wife who's been my wife for 46 years, I can't prove to you mathematically that she loves me, but I'd stake my life on it because I have 46 years of evidence that she does so. Now, you understand that kind of thing. Commitment in science as in life is made on the basis of evidence, and we'll return to that in a little bit. So, where does science sit vis-a-vis -vis faith in God? Well, the first stunning fact, and it is a stunning fact, I believe, although I've been familiar with it for many years, it's this, that modern science traces its roots to the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries with people like Galileo and Kepler and Newton. And you will all know, of course, that these men believed in God. And that is no accident, according to historians of science. Think of Alfred North Whitehead, who said this, Europe in 1500 knew less than Archimedes, who died in 212 BC. And yet 200 years later, Newton's Principia had been written. And he raises the question, why? What was it about Europe at that time that made it so congenial for the explosion that we call modern science to occur. So here's North Whitehead. It must come from the medieval insistence on the rationality of God, conceived as with the personal energy of Jehovah and the rationality of a Greek philosopher. The impress on the European mind arising from the unquestioned faith of centuries. Putting it slightly more simply and more expressively, C.S. Lewis wrote this, and he was referring to North Whitehead. Men became scientific. Why? Because they expected law in nature. And they expected law in nature because they believed in a lawgiver. Now, that is very interesting, isn't it? Let me put it bluntly, ladies and gentlemen. I am not remotely ashamed to be both a scientist and a Christian because arguably Christianity gave me my subject. You see, far from hindering science, it was faith in a rational creator that was the motor that drove science. So that was Newton, that was Kepler, that was Galileo. Now comes the problem. Isaac Newton's chair until recently was occupied by Stephen Hawking 
who is just a bit ahead of me in Cambridge and light years ahead of me in his mathematical brain power, incidentally. But I remember him very well. He says, in his book co-authored with Leonard Mlodinoff, The Grand Design, that you've got to choose between science and God. Isaac Newton says it was his faith in God that was the motor that drove his science. What has happened? And I want to try and explain what has happened so that we can understand what is going on. Why is it that certain leading scientists now claim that you cannot believe in God and be a credible scientist when the early pioneers all fitted into that category. Well, of course, and I did two Veritas forums in the Netherlands last week, and in each of them, the first one was a physicist I was debating, and the argument he came up with was that we've now discovered that God is a delusion like Santa Claus. The sociologist that I debated in the second one said exactly the same thing. So there's obviously a great deal of interest in Santa Claus these days. <laughs> now, it seems to me, ladies and gentlemen, that it's perfectly obvious that God is not in the same category as Santa Claus. I mean, have you ever met an adult that came to believe in Santa Claus? Have you? Of course not. Some of you are awake, obviously, but just a few. I have met many adults who've come to believe in God. I haven't met one who came to believe in Santa Claus. Now, the Santa Claus idea is responsible, it's in the title essentially of Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion, of many people not thinking about this subject at all because they've accepted Freudianism in Freud's idea that all this kind of talk is an illusion. God is a wish fulfillment, a projection of our desire for a father figure in the sky and all the rest of it. Well, it won't quite do actually because Germany's leading psychiatrist Manfred Lutz has just written a fascinating best-selling book called Eine kleine Geschichte des Größten, A Brief History of the Great One. It's not in English yet, I'm afraid. But in it, he argues this. He said, look, if there is no God, then Freud's argument is wonderful, a wonderful argument why religion is a delusion and we can forget about it, if there is no God. Of course, he says, if there is a God, the very same argument will show you that it's atheism that's a delusion. The projected desire never having to meet God or to be held accountable for the things that we've done in our lives. And Lutz's bottom line, which he puts very clearly is this, on the substantive question, whether there's a God or not, neither Freud, Frankel, nor Jung can help you one little bit. You'll have to look elsewhere. And yet people still make these assertions. Hawking said not long ago, religion is a fairy story for people afraid of the dark. And I was asked by the London Times how I responded to that. And I said, well, atheism is a fairy story for people afraid of the light. Well, you shouldn't laugh, really, because that proves nothing uh, on the basis of what I've said. But it's easy to make these assertions. We've got to go deeper into the subject matter. Why then the opposition between science and God? Well, one of the reasons is explained to you on the card that you got before you came in. As science continues to explain questions once thought to be the result of the supernatural, the gaps for which science has no answer seem to be narrowing along with the need for something supernatural to fill them. So when I had, we have debates in Oxford from time to time, every year we have a God debate where we dress up in dinner jackets and we have a confrontational parliamentary debate about God. And last year, I was in, on the Christian side, and Michael Shermer, known to many of you, editor of Skeptic magazine, was on the atheist side. And uh, during the discussion, he looked at me and he said, of course, he said, you're an atheist. You're an atheist with respect to it. He started with A for Artemis, B for Baal, and so on, and went through the alphabet until he got to Z for Zeus. And he said, you are an atheist with respect to all these gods. And I confessed it immediately. I am, ladies and gentlemen, an Azusist. I do not believe in Zeus. 
And then he delivered the bottom line, and he says, we just go one God further, and we get rid of Jehovah, the God of the Bible. And I thought, what an amazingly interesting argument, because it shows he knows nothing about the ancient gods of the ancient Near East. Because people who write authoritatively about those gods have pointed out a very significant effect about them. They are descended from the primeval universe. They appeared, whatever they were, they appeared from the matter of the original universe. And Werner Jaeger, a world expert on these gods, points out that the God of the Bible is utterly distinct. He did not descend from the heavens and the earth. He created the heavens and the earth. So the first point to realize is they're not talking about the same God. And that alerts me to the deeper question here. You see, the ancient Greek gods were gods of the gaps. Think of the God of thunder. I don't think Georgia Tech would believe in the God of thunder because you've got a department, I imagine, of atmospheric physics, and 10 minutes in there will soon convince you that there's no God of thunder. You can explain thunder by temperature gradients, electrostatic discharges, and all the rest of it. So exit the God of thunder. That is, the God of thunder was only ever merely a God of the gaps, a placeholder until science made an advance. Now, what I discover today, and it took me a long time to really realize it, is this notion of a God of the gaps has become so widespread that many people, particularly atheists, but not only atheists, think that that's what people like me believe. Now, try and follow the logic of this. If God is a God of the gaps, then of course you've got to choose between him and science because you've defined God as a placeholder until the scientific knowledge comes. But the God in whom I believe, ladies and gentlemen, is not a God of the gaps. He's the God of the whole show. He's the God of the bits I don't understand, and he's the God of the bits I do understand. So he doesn't disappear with every new scientific advance. Newton, of course, saw that, and the others saw it as well. So when Newton discovered his brilliant law of gravitation, he didn't say, wonderful, I've got a law, I've got an explanation, I don't need God. No, what did he do? He wrote Principia Mathematica, one of the most famous books, if not the most famous book in the history of science, expressing the hope in it that it would bring the thinking person to believe in a deity. Because you see, the more Newton uncovered of the way the universe worked, the more he admired the genius of the God that did it that way. And I suspect that's happened to you studying engineering here. I'm not an expert engineer. I can see a Rolls-Royce engine and see it looks beautiful. But if you studied engineering, and you know exactly how it works and the tolerances with which it's machined, you can say, you know, it took an absolute genius to design that gearbox. In other words, the more you understand of the gearbox, the more you admire the genius of the person who designed it, not the less. And so it is that the more I understand of the universe, the more I admire the genius of the God who did it that way. Now, here comes the important point. The confusion lies in thinking that God is the same kind of explanation as science gives. And that's false, of course. You all know, and you were probably introduced to it in school, why is the kettle boiling? Well, it's boiling because there's been a heat input of energy from a Bunsen burner. The molecules of water are vibrating faster and faster and faster and still steam begins to come off. No, that's not why it's boiling. It's boiling because I want a cup of tea. And you laugh. Well, which of those explanations is correct? And you say, don't be silly. They're both correct. You see, in ordinary life, we're used to complementary explanations. If we're thinking of a Ford motor car, and I say, well, let me give you two explanations. One is internal combustion and automobile engineering. The other is Henry Ford. Please choose. You would think I was a consummate idiot, wouldn't you? 
because you need both now. Surely we can all see that Henry Ford does not compete or conflict with automobile engineering and the law of internal combustion as an explanation for the motor car engine. You need both to give you a fully orbed explanation. In other words, to abstract from that, you need explanation in terms of mechanism and law on the one hand, that's the scientific explanation, and in terms of agency on the other, Henry Ford. And it's the same with the universe. An explanation in terms of mechanism and law is not an argument against an explanation in terms of an agent. In fact, there would be no universe at all for physicists to study if God hadn't created it. So it seems to me that a great deal of the confusion in this debate is failure to see the different levels of explanation. Now there's a little warning to be added in here. We all know what it means to say science explains, or do we? The law of gravitation, what does that explain? Well, it explains how to calculate, even without Einstein's corrections, putting a person on the moon. Absolutely brilliant stuff. And I was so excited when I discovered uh, Newton's law. But does it tell you what gravity is? No. Newton realized that. But many contemporary scientists do not realize it. Nobody knows what gravity is. Nobody knows what energy is. You see, even at that level, Science Explains has got limitations of which we're often unconscious. And the great philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein put it this way, he said, the great deception of modernity is that the laws of nature are explanations of the phenomena of nature when there's no such thing. They are descriptions of the phenomena of nature. They enable us to predict certain events and they can be very powerful, but they are not explanations in that fullest sense. So, what am I suggesting? I'm suggesting, number one, the antagonism, supposed, between God on the one hand and science on the other is to set up false alternatives. And they get set up, firstly, on the basis of a false understanding of God. Understanding God as a God of the gaps, of course you have to choose between God and science. But I've never met a sensible Christian, Muslim, or Jew who believed in a God of the gaps. Secondly, the nature of scientific explanation. It deals with a certain level of explanation. It doesn't deal with agency. And the existence of a mechanism or a law that does something is not in itself an argument for the non-existence of an agent who designed the mechanism. So, very frequently, because I'm a mathematician, people say to me, oh, I'm like Laplace, who was showing his equations for ballistics to Napoleon, and Napoleon said to him, Mr. Laplace, where is God in all these equations? And Laplace said, je n'ai pas besoin de cette hypothèse, I don't need that hypothesis. Well, of course not. He was talking about the laws governing motions of ballistics through the atmosphere or through a vacuum. And when I'm teaching that in class in Oxford, I don't mention God either. He was answering the question he was asked. But if the question had been different, if it had been, Mr. Laplace, how is it that there is a universe at all in which the laws of motion operate, then he might have had to mention God, mightn't he? Now, I'm well aware at this point that Richard Dawkins looms large, and I meet it everywhere I go, and I meet it here tonight, so I might as well answer it before I'm asked it. And that is this, look, putting God in at any level as an explanation is nonsensical, because if you believe, as I do, that God created the universe, then you will have to ask, who created God? And then you'll have to ask who created the creator that created the creator and so on. It goes on forever and so it's nonsense. So let's forget about it and go and play football and do something sensible. Well, this who created God question, I was amazed to find Richard Dawkins using it. 
Because you see, if you ask the question, who created God? Well, let's abstract from it. Who or what created X? The assumption behind the question is, of course, that X was created. Well, we know that created gods are a delusion, and if Dawkins' book had been called The Created God's Delusion, I don't think anybody would have bought it. You see, philosophers have a word for this. They call it a complex question because it hides assumptions that hide the real issue. If you say, who created God, you're immediately assuming that what you're talking about was created. But the central claim of Christianity and indeed Islam and Judaism is that God is eternal. He wasn't created, so the question doesn't apply to him. But there's this thing in its tail, as I pointed out to Richard Dawkins. I said to him, I think I'm going to ask you your own question. You believe the universe created you. So please tell me who created your creator. I've waited seven years for the answer to that. You see, what is really at issue, ladies and gentlemen, is the question of what is ultimate reality. Do the questions go back forever? And I think on both sides, they don't. For me as a Christian, the ultimate reality is God. He is the creator. He is eternal. And for many of my atheist friends, and I have many of them, the ultimate reality is the multiverse, mass energy, something like that. They don't go back forever. So the real question is not um, whether there's an ultimate reality or not, but which reality is ultimate? Is it God or is it the universe? Now, related to that is this. God cannot be an explanation at any level because explanation by definition, particularly in the scientific world, always proceeds from the simple to the complex. It's reductionistic. It reduces complicated things to simple things. As Dawkins says in his book, that his objective is to explain elephants and so on in terms of physics and chemistry. So therefore, if you postulate God as the explanation for the universe, then God is infinitely more complex than the universe, so it's no explanation at all. I take that seriously. And when I came to discuss it with Richard Dawkins, I said, there is one area where that doesn't work. I pick up a book. It's called The God Delusion. It's 400 pages long, roughly speaking. It's quite complicated. So I ask, what is its origin? And I discover its origin is in the infinitely more complicated mind of Richard Dawkins. So I dismiss that explanation because the explanation is much more complicated than the thing you're explaining. That's exactly his argument. And you see, ladies and gentlemen, explanation, reductionist explanation is extremely powerful. But there's one area I want to suggest to you where we all realize it does not work. And that is where language is involved, where information is involved. I have often sat with leading scientists who have said they believe everything can be explained bottom up in terms of physics and chemistry. And on one famous occasion in Oxford, but it's been repeated, I was sitting with the director of one of the biochemistry labs. And uh, he said that uh, we had nothing to talk about because he discovered rather too rapidly that I believed in God. And he said at dinner, I, he was an atheist and we were going to have a miserable evening, which is not the best way to begin a dinner. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 you're a reductionist. I am very interested in reductionism. I know at least three kinds. And I know one we share in common at least, and that's methodological reductionism. We split a big problem into little problems. We study the little problems and get insight for the big problems. He said, that's what I do. I said, good. But he said, that's not what I mean. I said, oh, no, it isn't. I know it's not what you mean. What you mean is that everything can be exhaustively explained in terms of physics and chemistry. He said, exactly. So I picked up the menu and I said, why don't we do an experiment? And he said, what, here at the dinner table? I said, yes, this is Oxford, why not? <laughs> so he said, what's the problem? It says roast chicken. I said, yes, it does. And look at it, R-O-A-S-T. Look at those marks on paper. They carry meaning. You've already interpreted the meaning. 
Now I've said those marks, R-O-A-S-T, in that order and with that shape are semiotic. They carry meaning. He said, exactly. Okay, I said, have a go. Explain to me the semiotics in terms of the physics and chemistry of the paper and ink. And his wife, who was sitting beside him, said rather too loudly, get out of that if you can. <laughs> but his answer stunned me. He didn't try to get out of it. He said, it can't be done. I was so shocked. I said, what do you mean? Physics and chemistry have only been running for five or six hundred years. It doesn't matter. You cannot do it because it involves semiotics and meaning. The explanatory power of physics and chemistry is not adequate to account for the meaning. And then he said, where did you get that argument? He could see I wasn't clever enough to have thought of it myself. <laughs> and so I confessed that I got it from a Nobel Prize winning a uh, medic called Roger Sperry. Now, here's the interesting thing about that little story, ladies and gentlemen. He said the situation with the semiotics, with the language, demands an explanation in terms of an intelligence. An intelligence of the gaps? Are we back with the God of the gaps? Well, no and yes. It depends on the nature of the gap. Because what I think we need to take on board is there are what I call good gaps and bad gaps. The bad gaps are closed by science. The good gaps are opened by science, and this is one of them. Now, I'm interested as a mathematician in trying to understand the very difficult subject of the theory of information. And you see, if you study the works of people like Leonard Brewing, and above all, Gregory Chaitin, his work on information theory and the basic ideas that surround it, that a machine can transmit information but not generate it. That, to my mind, is utterly fascinating. Now, this is a difficult topic, and there's a lot of argument about whether it applies completely here or not, but it suggests something very important. Because the human cell is an information processor. It is a machine. It's more than a machine. Now, if it is a machine, then what we're faced with, that machines cannot, and I'm quoting Brewin now, generate any information that's not either in their informational structure or in their input. That would suggest to me that a, na a purely naturalistic account is doomed to failure if the capacity to produce something linguistic is involved. Which is why, of course, the moment you see letters on paper or your name written in the beach, you immediately infer upwards to an intelligence. No matter how many automatic processes which you may not have seen are involved in putting those letters in the beach, you infer upwards to an intelligence. Well, we have lived to discover the longest word that's ever been discovered. It's called the human genome. It's four and a half billion letters long, roughly speaking, in a four-letter uh, alphabet, the codons that form it. So you've got this three and a half billion letter long word, everything exactly in the right order like a computer program. And I ask many people these days, what is the ultimate origin of this? And they say, chance and the laws of nature. I say, hold on a minute. You see your own name written in a beach and you immediately infer intelligence. Why don't you infer it here? Because you see, ladies and gentlemen, every analogy we know, all the experience we have, both within and without science, tells us that where there's language, there is a mind. Now, what I'm suggesting to you, therefore, is this, as we move into the question time, is that these worldviews can be put in a slightly different way. 
The atomist worldview of materialism starts essentially in the beginning with the particles, and the particles generated the worlds, and the worlds generated life, and life generated consciousness, and consciousness generated the mind, and the mind generated the idea of God, because there isn't a God. The other worldview goes like this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things came to be through him, and without him nothing came to be that came to be. And here is the biblical solution to the question that's been asked again and again in a series of books by Stephen Hawking, Lawrence Krauss, and so on. Why is there something rather than nothing? The answer is because an infinite, eternal God caused it to be. If you deny his existence, you have a massive problem, as any reading of the books by Hawking and Krauss will show. They have not solved the problem. Their nothing from which they claim the universe started is no such thing. It is alive with potentiality. It is a quantum vacuum. And I had the opportunity to debate Alan Guth, the father of the idea of inflation, which has been confirmed by the experiments at the South Pole on gravity waves. And I said to him in public at the MIT Harvard Faculty Club, I said, Alan, there's a great deal of confusion out there about nothing. I said, look, the nothing that you think the universe came from is not the nothing that most of us believe that nothing consists in. That's the absence of anything. He said, no, it isn't. I said, thank you very much. They have not solved the problem because, of course, if you are driven by the standard model, and here's the fascinating thing, to believe in a starting point for space-time, you are driven, therefore, to believe there was nothing in the philosophical sense before that. And so you're presented with a massive problem. How do you get something from nothing? But the physicists can't get something that's physical from nothing that's non-physical. So they have to redefine nothing to be physical. Listen to Lawrence Krauss's definition. He says in his book, because something is physical, nothing must also be physical, especially if it's defined as the absence of something. What? <laughs> I was staggered when I read that. But ladies and gentlemen, it seems to me that here we come to a very interesting pointer from science towards God. Alan Sandage is regarded rightly as one of the fathers of modern cosmology. He discovered the quasar. And he says, you know, God to me is a mystery. But he is the answer to the question, why there is something rather than nothing. I make the point again. If God hadn't created and didn't sustain the universe, there would be nothing for you in Georgia Tech to study. Thank you very much. The first question I'm going to ask is, evolution is a horrendously cruel process. So how can a good God create through such gratuitous cruelty? Okay, that's pretty succinct, thank you. All right. Uh, second one is, uh, how can we do physics at all if the world is not a causally closed system, since Christianity claims it's not? How can we do physics at all? if the universe is not causally closed, okay? Thank you. All right. Um, is that you done? Who's next? Who's, yeah, who's next? It's um, good for the audience to hear all the questions, can, and then I'll comment on them. All right, how, how about this? Can we reduce meaning to causation through something like speech act theory? Are those all your questions? Those are mine, yeah. Oh, I see. It was supposed to be one each, actually, but there we are. That's right. Off you go, the rest of you. Hello, Dr. Lennox. Hello. Uh, 
Um, okay, first question, when you were talking about if, if the hypothetical was, okay, theism is answers to people afraid of the dark, you retorted with atheism is people's um, uh, answer to fear of the light. We have evidence that people are afraid of dying and that being it. That's a fear that we can empirically observe and people will tell you themselves they have. What evidence do we have that atheists are afraid of an existence that continues after death. Do we have any whatsoever of any kind? Okay. And uh, you, you wanted just one question, is that correct, sir? Well, uh, we, we, well, I just have one more if it's okay, sir. Okay, well, let's hear it anyway. All right, I, <laughs> I appreciate it, thank you. Um, you uh, in the regards of, uh, of God creating the universe, you posit that if God had not created the universe, then the universe would not be exist for us to discuss because the universe cannot come from nothing. But you also posit God is uncreated in order to solve this. However, if we posit that, we have to concede that things that are not created exist, and so we can no longer carry on the assumption that uh, the universe is created because we don't know if it was created or not. We don't know what happened before the Big Bang. So if you could... I guess offer your thoughts and t opinion on that. Okay, I've okay. got it. I've got it. <laughs> Very interesting. Who's next? I have two questions, one of which was going to be his. I was going to give it to him. However... Well, you can give it to me. Yes. The... <laughs> You state that when we say lang or when we see language, we infer to intelligence. Now, some, a skeptic could say to this that prior to Darwin, whenever we saw nature, we inferred to intelligence. So why is it that you believe that the inference you're discussing is justified, given that we now know that the other isn't? And my other question is a lighthearted question. Uh, Richard Dawkins has recently been using his Twitter account to express his support of a YouTube atheist who goes by the name Jacqueline Glenn. And in, in her most recent video, one that he shared, she asks the following question. Why can't evidence for the Big Bang be evidence for the existence of an almighty ham and cheese sandwich? So my question for you, sir, is do you worship a sandwich? Question. It's a question because it refers to very common objections to cosmological arguments, which usually goes like this. Why does the cause of the universe have to be a god? Why can't it be a computer or a sandwich or the flying spaghetti monster? Why does it need to be what you call god? Okay, we, we've got it. <laughs> okay, is that it, gentlemen? Is that it? Well, thank you very much. Uh, these are very interesting questions, and as usual, they would require a lecture each. Um, <clears throat> so I'm not going to do them in the order that they came. I'm going to try and uh, reorder them slightly. Um, how could we do physics at all if the universe is not causally closed? I would suspect that we wouldn't know anything at all or be able even to reason if the universe were causally closed. Now this is an argument that C.S. Lewis has developed very powerfully. You see, the thing that I left out of my account because I ran out of time was this. One of the biggest problems these days relates to what I said at the very beginning. All scientists believe that we can do science, and you've referred to it, we can do physics. What do we do it with? Well, we do it with our mind. But what is the mind? Well, it's the brain, according to the reductionist. And what is the brain? It's the end product of a mindless, unguided process. Now, I would put to you that if you go into your lab at Georgia Tech tomorrow and you are introduced to a new piece of equipment by your professor who says, by the way, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is a very interesting new uh, piece of test equipment. It was constructed by a mindless, unguided process. <laughs> and I want you to use it for your final examinations. I think you'd object. You wouldn't trust it. And you see... <laughs> From where I sit as a Christian, I have a rationale for trusting my intelligence because 
there's a God behind the universe that the mind is studying and behind the mind. Now this is an argument that is now being taken up very powerfully by one of the leading philosophers in this country called Thomas Nagel. And Thomas Nagel has written a book called Mind and Cosmos. And his fellow atheists are massively upset. If you want to see how upset they are, just Google his name. Because Nagel is arguing that if you take this closed universe reductionist view, you end up by undermining rationality. As Alvin Plantinga, one of America's leading philosophers, a Christian this time, points out, if Dawkins is right, that our minds are essentially our brains and are cobbled together by mindless, unguided processes, then he has given us strong reason to doubt anything they tell us, including his science and his atheism. And my biggest problem here is this. My main objection to atheism, I'll be honest with you, is not because I'm a Christian. It's because I'm a scientist. It undermines the very rationality I need to do science. And ironically, it's the fact that the universe is open and there is a creator gives the rationale behind that. Now, this is a Q&A. I can only approximate to answers. Your question is brilliant. It deserves a whole lecture, but that's all I can say because there are other things that we need to be able to do. Um, the fear of death. What evidence do we have of atheist fear? Max Horkheimer was a brilliant thinker. And he says, you know, I fear that there might not be a God. And I fear it because if there's no God, then there'd be no ultimate justice. Thomas Nagel says, I don't want there to be a God. And other people have said, like Thomas Huxley, the relief that came when he discovered that there was no God and therefore there was no judgment to be faced after death. I mean, I, I, could, I, can't, I can't quote them all out of my head, but there are dozens of people. The fear of death is an immense driving power, not only for Christians, but for atheists. But the difference between the two, of course, is Christianity has an answer to death. It's the resurrection of Jesus, where atheism has, by definition, no answer whatsoever. So I think you can see, with many atheists, very honest, they are afraid of death. They are afraid of non-being, because they want to have some ultimate significance. Now, um, can we reduce meaning? Now, what I've written down here, I can no longer read. Um, <laughs> Was it, can we reduce meaning to speech acts? Was that the question? Well, half a minute. Um, I could interpret that in a marvelous way, I think, that would suit my purposes very well. And that would be that when you read the description of creation at the beginning of the Bible, it goes like this, and God said, let there be light. And God said, and God said. In fact, according to the Bible, it is a speech act, but it's more than a speech act. If I say, let there be light, nothing will happen unless somebody's working a switch at the back of the room. <laughs> I can't create light. The amazing thing is about God's speech acts is that they have creative energy and power. And I think you're hitting on something very important there because the Bible says relatively little about the how of creation, but what it does emphasize is this concept of speaking, of the word, in the beginning was the word, all things were made by him. So that speech, word, logic, information, command is primary, and the mass energy is secondary. So there is a very real sense in which I think you are running parallel to what is actually being claimed except there's a vast difference between God's speech act and my speech act. He is God, the creator, and his speech has got creatorial power. Now, um, if God is eternal, then things that are not created exist. So we don't know whether the universe is created or not, but that is not the common view of any physicist I meet. The, the, the convergent view of, of physicists is the standard model. And you may well know that I mentioned Alan Guth, but there are three. There's a trio of them, Bord and Vilenkin. And they have proved what are called the guth bord vilenkin theorems, not surprisingly. And the argument is that even if you've got a multiverse, 
the universe is past finite in time, and these theorems demand it. And in fact, uh, Alex Vilenkin uh, puts in his paper that cosmologists can no longer hide behind the idea of an eternal universe. So I'm only going on the basis of the science. Your argument uh, seems to be to not affect the science that we're approaching. Simply by saying that God is eternal uh, and he exists means that we can immediately think the universe is eternal. But half a minute, I thought we were scientists here and we were going on the basis of the science as to what we thought the universe was. Okay, now, um, language infers intelligence, yes. Before Darwin, nature implied intelligence. And afterwards, nature doesn't apply intelligence. Half a minute. Half a minute. Darwin dealt with life, the biosphere. The physicists have done phenomenal work in cosmologists on what's called the fine tuning of the universe. And I'm sure all of us in this room are aware that whatever you think of evolution or not, you need a fine tuned universe to get the carbon on which life depends. And it's very important to realize that the fine tuning argument is totally independent of any arguments about evolution. So I would say, no, after Darwin, there are many scientists, including the two Nobel Prize winners I mentioned, who infer a designing intelligence from nature because they're thinking, first of all, of the laws of nature. Where did they come from? That this is a law-like universe. Secondly, they're thinking of the fact that there was a creation. Thirdly, they're thinking of the fine-tuning. All of that long before you get to Darwin. So I, I simply think that your premise is incorrect. As to worshipping a sandwich, I, I think that's a very silly question, if you don't mind me being honest about it. I thought we were in Georgia Tech, where you decide things on the basis of evidence. And it's like God and Santa Claus. There's no competition between God and the sandwich. Because, ladies and gentlemen, you see, I can adduce from science, as I've tried to, some of the evidence why I believe in a creator, but it's not the only evidence. Looking at nature, and I'm an amateur astronomer, I love looking at Andromeda and all this kind of thing, and the sheer beauty of it overwhelms me with the majesty of God, but you only get so far looking at nature that way. There are other things, because you see, if I had read a little more or quoted a little bit more beyond where I went earlier, um, in the beginning was the word, I would come down to a stunning statement and the word became human and dwelt among us. Now that's coming down to, to the specifics of Christianity. I don't simply believe that you can trace the fingerprints of God in the physical universe and in its law likeness. I believe that God has revealed himself in Jesus Christ by coming into this world. So that opens up the possibility of having a relationship with God. And my evidence that God is not a sandwich comes mainly from there. And I don't know of any scientist in his or her right mind who would uh, think that the universe is produced by a sandwich. That's, that's just simply frivolous thinking, to be honest. Now, um, the very first question was to do with the cruelty of evolution. How can we believe in a good God? Now, of course, there's a prior question. And the prior question is an electrifying question. And of course it is, how much weight can the so-called evolutionary hypothesis bear? I didn't give you the subtitle of Thomas Nagel's book. Perhaps I ought to give it to you now, just so that you know. The subtitle of the book, Mind and Cosmos, is this. Why the neo-Darwinian view of the cosmos is almost certainly false. That is staggering because, as I say, Nagel is one of the top philosophers in this country. He's also an atheist. There are serious questions in my mind as a mathematician as to how much weight the evolutionary hypothesis will bear. Clearly bears some weight, as, as, as Darwin saw. But that it's a universal creative engine for the reasons I've partly given to you for, uh, from information theory, it cannot 
even begin by definition to account for the origin of life because evolution depends on you having life for it to start, so it cannot be an explanation for it. But I can leave that aside. I've written a book about it, so I'll shamelessly advertise the book. It's called God's Undertaker. But I take your point now about looking at the universe, whether it's evolution or not, it's full of horror and cruelty, isn't it? We all see that. And the question is, how do we come to terms with it? Either as an atheist, or in my case, as a Christian. And it's a hard question. It's a very hard question. Now, we regard it as evil. And that's interesting because, and this is a topic for another Veritas forum. Excuse I, me. Yes? How are any of these questions valid when the Gibbs free energy of the universe is the derivative of energy with respect to the constant age of the existence of thought. Did any of you understand that? I believe you did. No, I didn't. Well, I hypothesize then that the Gibbs free energy in any system of energy is the probability that it will be able to produce a self-replicating concept of itself. I think there would be many people that dispute that. And well, we, I know we that cannot, you, I know we, that we you cannot, would not. We cannot turn this into a physics seminar. But um, is, is this and, not and the, secondly, excuse I, I don't me, is this not the convergence of mathematics and religion? I don't understand how it could possibly be. Discussions of Gibbs free energy lie perfectly validly within the scientific sphere. They do not answer any questions about the existence of God or not. Because in the end, you know as well as I do that you've got to explain the existence of any energy at all. But I think we'll continue with the questions I was, I was asked because we must... No, I can't give you a guarantee that I will contest you on the theory because I, I don't think there's a contest. So can, can I just continue with my answer, please? You know, this is the first university in North America where this has happened. So I'll just continue with the answer to the uh, other question, if you don't mind, ladies and gentlemen. The question of, of cruelty and the question of suffering is one of the deepest questions all of us face. And we regard it as evil and one of the first issues that arises is this. Where do we get our concepts of good and evil from if there is no God? Now, that's a hugely contested area. And I would want to argue with Dostoevsky is that we cannot have a rationally grounded concept of good and evil if there is no God. Of course, because I believe that every man and woman is made in the image of God, I believe that we all do have a concept of good and evil and can behave morally. Now, I can go into this a bit more, but I'm very conscious that we've run over the time allotted to the four men at the front. And can I, with your permission, just leave that question of suffering and evil in the air and go to the audience and collect a few questions? And if some of you want me to go on with that, I will, but in the audience section. But I would like to get a few questions from the audience. Is that all right? Okay, so fire away. Let's get a few questions from the audience. Put up your hand and I'll recognize you. There's one waving fiercely at the back and here's a man here. Okay, you go because you're here. Come up to the microphone, would you? That would help. This is not a question, but on behalf of uh, Georgia Tech, uh, Dr. Lennox, I would like to apologize for- Oh, no, uh, don't worry about it. Thank you for coming, and I hope we can have you back. Listen, listen, don't you worry about it. Georgia Tech is not one individual. Okay, next in line, please. Okay, uh, so you said earlier that um, thinking Christians don't believe in this God of the gaps. Uh, do you have a 
uh, rationally you know, self-consistent um, and falsifiable definition of God that you could give. Okay, definition of God falsifiable in the Popperian sense, I take it. Okay, two. So, so my question revolves around moral relativism. Uh, we grow up getting different pains uh, growing up. You know, I experience different pains than somebody else. Um, somebody else experiences different pleasures. And my concepts of morality and thus concepts of, of a God or a God or center around that. I'm curious on how you sort of address that in your Christian framework. Uh, specifically, if somebody has different sets of experiences and has a different concept of God, how do you sort of merge those views together um, if the experiences are different? Um, that's Okay, thank you. Very perceptive question. Yes, please. Yeah, so you talked a little bit about the cosmology of uh, men like Krauss who have the idea that the universe came from a quantum vacuum. And you introduced some concepts such as the bohr guthen vilenkin theorem. And I was wondering if you could explain a little bit more how we can uh, for sure arrive at the idea that there was actually nothing, like a negation of anything, as opposed to Krauss's idea of a quantum vacuum. And kind of connected with that, why do Vilenkin and I guess you said Guth has debated you on this, why do they have different philosophical interpretations of the science they give and you use the science for your interpretation and they use it for another? Why is there that discrepancy? Thanks. Okay, number four. Hi, Dr. Lennox, just wanted to reiterate what, I do have a question, but I did want to reiterate what the uh, first gentleman said. I do apologize on behalf no. of <laughs> Georgia Tech and the rest of it. I'm actually a former engineer and a, a law student, and I was interested in how you opened your talk with um, a discussion of how mathematics is, at one point in your talk you mentioned how rationality, uh, perhaps probably even mathematics itself, requires uh, mind, an open, open causal universe. I was wondering if you might be willing to expound a little more on the uh, idea of mathematics, or the problem of mathematics, and applying it to the real world when we don't have, uh, apart from a theistic worldview, where I, I basically see three prerequisites for mathematics to be useful. There has to be a rational order to the universe, um, there ha and our, we have to have minds that are, are rationally capable, and then there has to be some sort of correlation between the two that we're justified in relying on yeah. in order to apply math. And I was wondering if you might, as, as a Christian mathematician, uh, expound on that idea a little okay, more. Okay, I'll take one more, and then I'll, we'll see if we have time for some more. Um, hello, Dr. Lennox. Hello. Um, I wanted to ask, earlier on during the talk, you said that you consider mathematics a subset of science. However, <laughs> earlier on, <laughs> sorry. Um, well, they give, you, they give you at Cambridge a BA in mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> um, however, you said that um, pure, pure mathematics, um, you separated pure mathematics from evidence. However, pure mathematics um, comes from intelligence itself, which is, which you said is the greatest connection to God. Yes. So wouldn't pure mathematics then be greater than science itself? Well, you flatter mathematics, thank you very much. <laughs> so let's, let's have a look at these questions and then if we have time, um, we'll go into them. The first question was, um, thinking Christians don't believe in a God of the gaps. I ought to add there that unfortunately some Christians do believe in a God of the gaps and they give that impression. They let their faith depend on some, um, surely God is behind this little bit of biology or something like that. And in effect, they are believing in a God of the gaps. And what I want to stress here is that we need to be clear what God we're talking about. And your question is quite right. Can we give a definition of God? Now here, of course, you run into difficulty. Because the big things in the universe in science, we can't define them. We can't define gravity. We can't define energy. We don't know exactly what they are, and yet we find these con concepts very useful. Now, the interesting thing about the question of God is, how can we give a definition of God? Well, we can extrapolate from our experience of the universe, and we could argue that God is 
uh, powerful. We could argue that God is intelligent. God has created the universe with laws. But if we really want to get to know God, you see, the crucial step here in logic and in thinking is that God is not a theory. He's a person. Now, we are all persons. So how do you get to know a person? How would I define you, for example? Well, let me, the word definition isn't totally appropriate, but get to know you and what you're like. How do we get to know God and what he's like? Well, I will never get to know you simply by studying you scientifically. If I put you into an electron tunneling microscope here, and I'm sure there's some very impressive ones, I'll not get to know you. In fact, I'll never get to know you unless you reveal yourself to me as a person. The Greek word skeptine, from which we get skepticism, means checking something out from a distance. And that's a very healthy attitude in these things. We check them out from a distance. But if you want to get to know a person well, you'll have to give up your distance. Some of you already know that. It's extremely important to realize it. And therefore, how can I give a definition of God? I would reword it. I believe we can get to know God because God has revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ. And Jesus came as a person, a human being, God incarnate into this world and shows us what God is like. And we can get much closer in that sense to what one might approximate to a definition by looking at Jesus because he claims that he is God. So God is like him. So that would be my approach to that. And as to falsifiability, I think it probably comes at a different level. I do believe Christianity is falsifiable. At its heart, there stands the claim that Jesus rose from the dead as a matter of history. Now, that is a falsifiable thing. And the reason I believe it is because the historical evidence, uh, 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 the historical evidence um, supports it. But now I must go on to the next one. And I'm going to take the scientific thing first. And that is the cosmology and nothing. And you wanted me to say a bit more about it. I'm going to do another shameless bit of advertising. I've written a book called God and Stephen Hawking and <laughs> analyzed what he says about nothing. And it, it does concern me. You see, the nothing that most of us think of as nothing is the absence of anything. If I say I went down the road in Atlanta and met nobody, it doesn't mean I met somebody called nobody. It means I didn't meet anybody right? So nothing is the absence of anything. No laws, no physics, no atoms, no electrons, no particles popping in and out of existence, nothing. Now you see, the physics forces them to believe that the universe came out of that, but they can't get a universe out of that. So they redefine nothing. And they do it in a spectacularly interesting way. Listen to Hawking do it. Because there is a law of gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Well, when I first read that, I thought, what? Because there is a law of gravity, because there's something, the universe will create itself from nothing. That's a flat contradiction. And he says, because there's a law of gravity, he doesn't even say because there is gravity. And what a law of gravity would mean if there's no gravity, I wouldn't know. Because laws are descriptions of something that already exists. So it seems to me you've massive problems there. Now, if you step back to the biblical view, the very interesting thing is the discussion, I've quoted it once, but sometimes we're so familiar with this that we don't realize how powerful it is in the ancient Greek world because the Greeks were interested in the differentiation between the eternal, things that did not come to exist, and the temporal, things that did come to exist. And let me quote it to you again so that you see the power of it. In the beginning was the word. That is, was in Greek is also a statement of existence. The word already was. That is, the word exists eternally. All things came to be through him. But now there's an extra clause, and it's the most interesting of all. And without him, that is without the word, nothing came to be that came to be. 
So if you're talking about things that came to be, the claim is that nothing came to be that came to be without the word. So the first logical thing is the word didn't come to be. And the universe came to be. That is, it came to be. There was nothing in the philosophical sense before. So it seems to me that the biblical view makes perfect sense. Because the universe has a cause, but it's not physical. God is spirit. The primary stuff in the universe is not mass energy anyway. It is spirit. Now that's a different uh, category altogether. Mind is primary, mass energy is derivative. So it seems to me that the Bible is talking a lot of sense. Whereas the physicists who are wandering outside their own sphere are talking, well, what Hawking says about the universe creating itself is nonsense, isn't it? If I say X creates Y, those words mean that if you assume X, you get Y. If I say X creates X, it means if you assume X, you get X. And what does that mean? It means that nonsense remains nonsense, even if high-powered scientists are writing it. <laughs> so that's what I'd say about that. Now, what you said about mathematics, I largely agree with. That mathematics used to be regarded as the queen of the sciences. And it's the mathematical describability of the universe that's the staggering thing that caused Einstein to say the only incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it's comprehensible. Eugen Wigner, who won the Nobel Prize for Physics, said he wrote a famous paper in 1961 called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics. Well, he's right if atheism is true. It's utterly unreasonably effective. He's completely wrong if Christianity is true. Because the reason mathematics is effective, that something I think up in my head here applies to the universe out there, is because the same creator is responsible for both. Now, the mathematics point, I separated maths from evidence. I didn't separate mathematics from evidence. Mathematics is evidence of something. What I said is that the processes of doing mathematics in pure mathematics are axiomatic and deductive and give you a logical proof that you do not get in any other branch of science. That's all I was saying at that point. Now, the final question in this group was moral relativism, different people have different experiences, and so on and so forth. Now, I'm well aware of that, but there's another side to put to that. And it's a side that I find very striking. C.S. Lewis brought it to my attention many years ago when he points out that if you go around the world, every philosophy, every religion, every absence of religion, every worldview, no matter where it is, you will find the golden rule. Do unto others what you would that they do to you. Everywhere you find it. And from where I sit, that is fascinating. There seems to be a common core of morality. Now, there are variations, of course. But there is a central core, which is one of the reasons um, that society doesn't completely collapse. Now, what's that traceable to? I believe it's traceable to one of the most profound things that you find in any literature. It's the biblical statement that human beings are created in the image of God. And it's the foundation of all the ethics of Western society, as leading atheists like Jürgen Habermas admit. Made in the image of God gives human beings infinite value. Now, there will be variations, as you suggest, but I think it's worthwhile emphasizing that common core because one of the best ways of discussing with those who disagree with us is to respect the fact that they are made in the image of God and therefore they are, by definition, equally valuable to us. And I do feel very strongly that if we... Uh, believe that others are equally valuable to us, then we'll treat them in a very different way from what we would if that were not true. Now, have we time? I don't see the directors of this. Perhaps they've gone home already. Um, <laughs> have we time for a couple more questions or not? Sorry? Two minutes or so. Okay, the first one there. Uh, so, so one of the things I would like to uh, remark, um, you make it sound a bit ridiculous that things can uh, come out of nothing. 
Um, so I would like to share uh, quantum fluctuations with people. Um, so for a very short time, you can uh, violate the conservation of energy and you cre can create a particle and an antiparticle and they come out of nothing. And, and the way we can observe that is uh, close to a black hole, one of the particles can fall into the black hole and then the other particle just keeps existing and it's called Hawking radiation. But, um, okay, I, I understand that. But a black hole is not nothing. A quantum vacuum is not nothing. No, the, and the, Alan, the, Goeth, the, Alan Goeth told me himself that they are not talking about nothing in the philosophical sense. No. I agree with you. Quantum fluctuations, fine. But they're not nothing in the philosophical sense. Well, the, the particles come from nothing. I they mean, don't they, come from... They, they are they, created in vacuum. So yeah, but nothing. there is a vacuum. There is something there. It's not nothing in the absence of everything. I mean, vacuum there are laws is kind of the operating. definition of nothing. Well, I suggest you write a letter to Alan Guth um, <laughs> and see, because he assured me that that's not the case. We have time for one more very brief one. Hi, you began by saying that you need a God in order to do science, but there's two assumptions in science where that the laws of science are, uh, are inductive in the sense that you know, they are constant through time and that they are uniform through space. Um, and that the argument from, uh, from religion is that God maintains the laws of the universe by his, his power. Why are some responses from scientists when you say that you can't prove that the laws of science are through science? that are inductive because, and that are outside of God? Oh, well, um, I, I think I understand what you're saying. What, what I'm claiming here is there's no rational justification for having a universe at all, which is law-like, without God. That is, the laws of nature pointers towards God. And we do our inductions within the universe that exists. So the kind of response I, I get to this kind of thing is that the laws can account for it without God, but then that raises the question, where did they come from in the first place, these universal laws? So it doesn't solve the problem at all. I will have to leave it there. The one question I left unfinished was the one that was asked by the four uh, there, and it's the, the suffering thing. I'm going to say just a few words about that, if I may, very briefly, because we need to face the hard questions. Now, if I take the atheist route, and many of my friends do, they say I cannot believe in God because of the suffering. Well, that appears to be a solution until you realize that they haven't solved the suffering. It's still there. But they have got rid of all hope. Now, I have a problem with suffering because I still believe in God. And the thing that helps me to cope with it is not the philosophical argument, because we've all engaged on it and love doing it. If there were a good God who's all powerful, etc., he should, he might, etc., etc. And none of us have ever found that kind of argumentation satisfactory. So I ask a different question. Granted that there's suffering in the world, and granted that there's a lot of good. I was debating this at the Oxford Literary Festival just a few days ago with Stephen Law, who's an atheist. There's a lot of good and there's a lot of evil. So what, how, how can we come to terms with that? And sometimes it reminds me of Coventry Cathedral. If you've been there, you'll see immediately when you go through the door that a bomb hit it. But you'll also see traces of beauty, and that's what life is like. We, in this university here, we are unimaginably privileged. Since I started this evening, how many thousands of infants have died unnecessarily? You see, that puts the balance. How do you cope with that? Well, since I can't cope with it philosophically, I ask myself a different question. And it's this. Granted that there's goodness and granted that there's barbed wire, terrorism, pain, catastrophes, tsunamis, and so on. Is there any evidence anywhere in the universe that there is a God who can be trusted with it? And my answer to that goes to the heart of Christianity. Because at the heart of Christianity, there's a cross. The claim is that the one on the cross was God incarnate, so it raises a very big question. What is God doing on a cross? And at the very least, ladies and gentlemen, 
it seems to me that that tells me this, that God has not remained distant from the problem of human suffering, but has himself become part of it. Christ did not remain on the cross. He died and he rose. And that gives me the gateway to true ultimate justice. You see, atheism has no ultimate justice. Richard Dawkins said to me when we discussed it, he said, I fight for justice on the earth. I said, that's marvelous, Richard, but the vast majority of people who have ever lived won't get justice in this life, and you believe there's no other life, so they won't get justice there either. It's a hopeless philosophy. But I said, because I'm a Christian and believe that Jesus rose from the dead and believe that that is the evidence that he is going to be life's ultimate judge, I do believe there's ultimate justice, that the terrorists aren't going to get away with it simply by blowing their brains out when they've ruined the lives of millions of people. And so Christianity faces this question and it also opens up those major possibilities that would have to be the topic of another time. And that is through the death and resurrection of Christ. There is the possibility of receiving the thing I desperately need as a human being. That is forgiveness and love. But that's for another time. Thank you very much for your patience. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.